It is evening at this point, I think, that we, we would say that, 5 o'clock, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sanaz, one of the co-curators of the Prelude Festival, and I'm really excited to welcome you to one of our works in process showings. Um, works in process are excerpts from productions that are new or in development. Uh, in this specific grouping, we have we're very excited to present uh, work by the absolutely wonderful Kate Benson, and Jessica Almazi, and company, uh, Dupali Gupta, and Nada Muse. Um, there will be a brief transition in between, and we ask that you stay for the duration of the performances and presentations. Um, and then please do stay after for a brief and always fascinating moderated talk back with the artists. Um, thank you again. There's another one of these at 7 o'clock. There's another one at 8 o'clock. And then there's a closing night uh, party at the Museum of Sex. So it's going to be a good night, and I can't wait. We're going to kick it off. Yeah? Okay, cool. <laughs> Universal road trip and let you community in the nervous lumps, the lumpy lumps of ride and no thank you. <laughs> this is the year 2000. Rare to find a weed out of then. Not now, but then. Everybody ate donuts before. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> Where the fuck were you? <laughs> These, you want one? No, no. I'll take one. Next time I I wanna that right tomorrow. No. no. 
band starts and they are on the move. Can I at least change the music? No, drive it besides, rule the rules. This is a stupid rule, we should all decide. When you drive, you can decide. You just told me I couldn't drive. <laughs> Driving is not operating the jukebox. You have points on your license. You aren't going to drive today. The driver picks the music because the driver has to concentrate. Drives. That's it. So, I can't listen to that shit anymore. Oh my god, just go to sleep. We'll be there in an hour. Take the next exit. What's the number? The next one. The next exit. 19. 18. The next one's 19. The next one's 18. Take it. Take, take this exit. 19? It's supposed to be 18. Wait, wait. Take it or not. Take 18. So the next, next exit. Wait. Take the exit toward... Hey, hey, my job. Don't. Yes, but my job is to make sure that we... Which exit? 18. 18. Take 18. Thank you. Get it together, please. <laughs> it's together. My shit is together. Worm assignments. Who was the last one with a single? I was. Then it's your turn. Great! We should all have singles all the time. Four rooms. Seven rooms. What's the difference? A union contract. None of us have one. So we have to share. I should be in the union. It can't be that hard to get in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the stupid catch-22. You can't get a contract if you're not in the union. And you can't join the union without a union contract. It's all a fucking rigged fucking game. <laughs> I was in the union. It's not that great. <laughs> We'd have our own rooms. That seems great. We wouldn't be here at all. They can't afford a union. They can't raise enough money to turn a profit with union people. Union people are too expensive. <laughs> we have what we need, and yes, they make more money. If they don't have to buy seven rooms every night. Yes, but really? I mean, we play cards, talk, keep each other company. We're all together all the time anyway. What do you want, seven separate cars? And intern to get you a lot, even if you want one? Are you secretly management? <laughs> I'm a person who read my contract before I signed it. <laughs> I'm having a great time. And I don't mind sharing and rotating a single. It's great. It's kind of like camp. When are you in the union? Oh, uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> I thought once you were in, you were in. Hey, what's next? Uh, we're on this road for a while. And that's uh, exit 181. We're going to Route 23 East. What happened? Did you get kicked out? How do you, how can a person get kicked out? Well, you have to keep paying your dues. Following the rules, I wanted wanted to do some other stuff. <laughs> oh. I mean, all I want right now is to join. It never occurred to me that you could get kicked out. Now it's a whole new set of problems to worry about. To Jesus, to, you have to work so hard to get in. Not, not, not really. <laughs> and then you couldn't even stay. In. And now you're here. Jesus. You're so calm for someone who I mean, slid back into this. You'd be like <laughs> underpaid, underrespected. I was really psyched when I got this gig. I still am. <laughs> so many people wanted this job, and you have it. There are people who wanted to be here and then not, because they weren't up to it. So I don't think that's, the whole thing, it's, it's not that simple as ready and not ready. I mean, you can be ready to work and not find the right job. And not be right for that particular job. 
too tall or too short or whatever, and then you don't get the job. I don't want to think every time I don't get a job it's because I'm not good enough. I mean, Jesus, who wants to live with that? To get this job, all you needed to be able to do was read. Fuck you. <laughs> you have to show up and not smell too weird and say the words in order. And then the job is yours if they give it to you. I think it's a little more complicated than that, and so do you. You just think. None of you watched auditions. I did. I know who you beat out to get this job, each one of you. So believe me when I tell you, you're lucky to be here. And also, you're here because you're good at what you do. And also, you're here because we thought you'd be ready to do this. Thank you. <laughs> and also, right for the job. But on a job like this, it's harder than it sounds to show up, not smell weird, and say the words in order. So don't go thinking we don't, you don't have to try. We need your best efforts out there, not your bullshit. <laughs> like they could tell. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're the first thing most of these people have ever seen. So, you want to give them some substandard, not trying bullshit? <laughs> Is that it? You know? You're all? Never mind. I got jobs I shouldn't have. I got screwed when I shouldn't have gotten screwed. Nothing works so neatly. <laughs> Nothing in the world works according to your little reasons. So just turn up the music. <laughs> this is the first job I've had in a long time. Because I started that panic attacks every time I left the house. So you're unstable is what you're saying? <laughs> this, that's some super duper stigma bullshit. Have you ever had a panic, a panic attack? No. Because I'm tough. <laughs> no, just lucky. I don't let shit get me down. You have to take care of your own head. A panic attack is not punishment for not taking care of You're such a... <laughs> How can... <laughs> How long do I stay on this road? <laughs> Two more miles. Look at all those pawn shops. People fucked up, fucking up, finding themselves in emergencies, selling that stun gun. When does a person need a stun gun? And if they needed it, now they're selling it. Because what? They're so desperate? How did they let that happen? The world is full of loose wheels. I don't have panic attacks because I was raised raised to think ahead. Truly, really, calmly, <coughs> to live within my resources, build a sturdy life for myself. How did you wind up here? <laughs> what are you talking about? This is great. The open road, adventure. Join the circus, see the world. This is like a vacation. Turn left at the traffic light. This one? Yeah, this one, coming up. And I can treat it like a vacation because I worked my ass off and salted away a bunch of money so that when I needed to get out of town, I got myself this job. And here I am, out of town, paid vacation. No crisis waiting for me around the corner. The van turns left. <laughs>
about 15 miles, I think, away. 15 miles, I think. I have to pee. I'll be with you. A bladder the size of a woman? <laughs> it's all the coffee. It's panic pee. Anxiety pee. Panic pee. Definitely. Panic pee. Someone's peeing in the woods. <laughs> so many people right now. Peeing in the woods. <laughs> Alleys. Fields. Deserts. Rivers. <laughs> swimming pools. Right now. All over the world. <laughs> people are peeing. Can you some house? idea about where is better. Do you like places with food? There are no deer in the city. I've never seen a deer in the city. Doesn't mean they're not there. You're going on this road for two miles or so. Thanks. Just because you don't see deer doesn't mean they're not there. Actually, yes, that's exactly what that means. If I don't see deer, then there aren't any deer. Unless you're performing some sort of deer blindness. You think you know everything that goes on, but you don't. No one does. But you really don't. Stop. Does anyone have a tweezer? The world is full of hiding places, and deer are good at hiding. I like that idea. Deer hiding all over the city. I, I can see one of my eyebrows hairs if I squint. I, I really need a tweezer. <laughs> Don't squint. What's the next turn? Coming up, right here. Turn left. Right or left? Uh, left. Turn left. Like I said, turn left right here. <laughs> left. Can't you just say now, turn left now? Look, just now. Turn right. Turn right now. Turning right. <laughs> and then we're looking for Old Mill Road. 4952 Old Mill Road. This is 154 Old Mill Road, so I guess we stopped this for a while. Are you sure it isn't a typo of the address? We're looking for the minaret, no, the minuet on Old Mill Road. It'll probably be like one of those old movie theaters, like the Odeon, like two towns ago. Really? Oh, great. I love an old theater. The Odeon had mice. A mouse ran across my foot when I was getting dressed. All theaters have mice. Theaters are mouse, like mouse heaven. Yeah. Well, then they'd be dead if it was mouse heaven. Sloppy <laughs> 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 people eat the eating crumbly snacks and tracking in all 
all kinds of goodness in the pile of fabric and junky corners. Every theater is like a giant mouse nest. That's what I would name my theater if I, if I had one, mouse house. <laughs> Are we in the right place? Are we going the right way? Someone tell me what to do. Just stay on Old Bill Road. I mean, this just looks like fast food sprawl. Sprawl. Sprawling. Sprawling. Sprawl. It's just sprawl. This isn't where anyone lives, right? I'm checking the address. Why don't we just stop and ask for directions or something? We're not lost. No, we're just not where we should be, so how is that different from lost? We're on the right road. We just have to. Waffle House! I fucking love Waffle House! <laughs> a whole empire of sweet, cheap, delicious pecan waffles. I mean, I like waffles. Their waffles have tiny squares, not giant Belgian squares, which I like, but it's kind of dirty. It has some funk, but the food is clean. Waffles, what could go wrong? Hmm. Belgian waffles hold the butter better, like a whole lake of butter in one square. See, that's where you're wrong. Waffle House waffles are perfect. Do people eat veggies down here? What do they do for rawfish? <laughs> Oprah. Are you sure about this address? Vegetables are too expensive. Unless they're potatoes, I love potatoes. Potatoes make the world go round. Or corn, corn syrup, popcorn, corn chips. Junk. Yeah. Farms. They're farms. People grow their own. Look around you. Chili's, McDonald's, <laughs> Ruby, Subway, Ruby Tuesdays, TGIF, Burger King, Arby's, Wendy's, Denny's, Papa John's. Rural means farm. What, what you can see from the road is nothing. Before dinner, at least unload the trailer so we can. We only have an hour in the morning to set up. All I want is to sleep. So sleep. Not sitting up, laying down, under the covers, listening to the music that I like. Not this stupid bullshit. You drive, you pick the music. Fine, I'll drive. I'm the driver. This is bullshit. Getting close, 3,000 whatever was the last dress. Shakespeare country. Cows, strip malls, pawn shops. <laughs> These people want some Shakespeare. <laughs> What's the name of the place? The presenters are feeding us. God damn it, it's going to be greasy pizza. Why do they think they know how to make pizza down there? Because they do. They make pizza. And, and for the record, everyone down here, all the places that are hosting us, are doing the best they can with the 25 cents they have to have an arts program. The last place we were, the school board spent the arts budget on Bibles. So take your paycheck, you cool pizza, you quit complain. I didn't say cold, I said greasy. I just think a little quiet. You don't know anything about how people live around here. What they have to put up with. How many people are out of work or are struggling to learn anything in a shitty, underfunded school that doesn't want to talk about Darwin. You don't know anything about struggle or poverty or what it's like to, to not be able to buy fancy cheese. You never lived anywhere that didn't have fancy cheese. <laughs> and bookstores and art museums. You take every advantage you have for granted and then look down your goddamn nose at anyone that lives in a place that couldn't provide. When those people who live in those places, they're fucking heroes. <laughs> We're just surviving one more day. 
And then 20 of them got together and formed an arts, arts council in a field in a county in the middle of this and hired you to come down here and get paid to dress up and put on a play is a fucking miracle. So shut up about your greasy pizza problems and be a human being.
I want to be safe. Don't let me run into the unknown. Hold me again. Don't let me reach for what isn't there. Hold me back. Back to the other. I want to be a pop so don't let me. I'll die. Overdose or suicide? Mysterious circumstances. I want to be a rock star, but I can't. It will get too loud and I'll die. Don't allow me to run for public office, no matter what the polls are saying. I'll do something foolish and impulsive. Like how I'm fan with the campaign staffer. That doesn't sound like me. Never let me forget who I am. Please, remember who I am. So you can remind me later. Never let me forget who I am. No matter how morbid or random I become. <laughs> Here's something you may not know about me. <laughs> I have a great sense of sound. <laughs> no, but really, really, here's something you may not know about me. I'm a born disciple. I'm a natural devotee. I would give up playing God if I found one. Born disciple, natural devotee, Eventual heretic. Are there any ex angsty teenagers in the house? <laughs> Former hormonal egomaniacs? What happened to you? And did it ever go away? I look in the mirror and I am finally older. Too old to be a prodigy. Sometimes I feel like I'm a genius in disguise. I should see a doctor about that. I look in the mirror and I miss my own face, my old face, the face I used to see. Am I being weird? Am I being weirder than normal? Content warning. I look in the mirror. Do you feel like you know who you are? You asked me. I told you. You told me. I know who I am. I was impressed. What an achievement. I told you. I know who I am. I'm a good liar. You told me you don't trust actors. I'm an actor. You're different. Yes, I'm different. I decided to become different for you. Yeah, you. You know who you are. Don't worry, they won't. I redacted your name. In January 2017, I sent name redacted an email with an attachment. Subject line, hey, name redacted. It's Dupali. Body of the email. I hope you had a good trip down to DC. Slash, I'm glad we got to see each other last night. Slash, I'm, I'm glad, glad we, we met. <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe a strange song to send to you, but that's also kind of why I'm sending it. It's definitely about sex, but also God. If you investigate me, you should know there is melancholy in my lyrics. You might find more songs about sex, and it's all actually all about Emily Dickinson. <laughs> Looking forward to your work. D. D. The attachment was a song. Spread, spread, stranger. 
is unkind. Will you save me from being unfairly defined? introduce some terms that may prove useful to us. I'll start with mania. What is mania? An overly elevated state. Technically speaking, heightened overall activation with enhanced effective expression. Activation and expression. Overly elevated. Feeling fizzy, like a seltzer. What is a manic episode? A manic episode includes an extended period of persistently intense mood. In order to qualify, that period must be marked by at least three of these symptoms. Inflated self-esteem, intensified theatric speech, ecstatic racing of thoughts, decreased need for sleep, pacing and inability to sit still, excessive risk taken. These answers are tributaries to another river of asking. 
What is bipolar disorder? A manic episode predicates a bipolar one diagnosis. What is bipolar one disorder, a bipolar spectrum disorder? Where do I fall on the spectrum? And what pushed me? Did I trip on something? In March 2017, I was diagnosed with bipolar one disorder after the onset of my first manic episode. That's a fact we can latch on to. When you imagine your suicide, and if you've never imagined your suicide, congratulations. <laughs> anyway, when the rest of you imagine your suicide, what does it look like? How does it happen? One of my earliest influences was Richie Tenenbaum, who didn't succeed in his attempt and isn't a real person. Richie Tenenbaum is a character played by Luke Wilson, in the film, The Royal Tenenbaums, <laughs> written and directed by Wes Anderson and released in 2001, when I was 11. In the film, Richie Tenenbaum slits his wrists while looking at himself in the mirror, while Needle in the Hay by Elliot Smith, who stabbed himself in the heart, is playing in the background. He doesn't succeed in his attempt, and it's a fictional event. Richie Tenenbaum's suicide is a constant hypothetical, never ending, ever present, as is mine. Is yours? Take me to an empty place. 
visit Iowa is so boring if you summon me I will arrive I'll cast a spell smiley face <laughs> I was never hungry until my stomach forgot what hunger felt like a tiny woman called me tiny and pinched my tiny lips. I wore black lipstick to therapy I wore eyeliner to the gynecologist I enjoyed being terrified on stage and off it was like I was under I wrote little poems for Instagram and posted a lot on Facebook. <laughs> Who else feels like a walking archive? A talking library? A stalking machine? Uh, what is the relationship between personal transformation and revenge? Instagram. <laughs> if I had a child, I would tell them I wouldn't depend on me. <laughs> if I had a child, I would warn them in the morning, I'm temporary. And so is, as you know it, it will all be long gone, eventually. My favorite emoji right now is the blue butterfly. What's yours? <laughs> the laughing goats. Are you open to a radical suggestion? Open and ready. Call me on the phone and say hi. In November 2016, I watched the election on a projector in a basement. In December, I quit smoking. I met Name Redacted in January 2017. In February, I went to visit Name Redacted in Iowa. I returned in March. April. I don't know what happened in May 2017. June, July, August. In September 2017, I wondered privately whether recovery was an option. October, November, December, January, February. In March 2018, I turned 28 on the 28th. It was my golden birthday. In September 2018, my therapist said I seemed good. I agreed. I wrote these words in September 2019. As of October 2019, my public position on this matter is that I am doing well and am a credit to my disorder. Come visit Iowa, so boring. If you summon me, I will arrive. I'll cast a spell. Smiley face. From the old English spell, story, fable, myth, from the proto-Germanic. I can tell you this in the dark. From the Proto-Germanic Spellum. To say aloud, to recite. I am already in love with you. And I will change my life for you. And I will change where I live for you And I will change who I am for you As long as you love me too And 
and keep fucking me like you love me so that I know how you love me you don't have to say you love me just fuck me like you love me already I am already in love with you and I will change my life for you and I will change where I live for you and I will change who I am for you as long as you love me too and keep fucking me like you love me so that I know how you love me you don't have to say you love me just fuck me like you love me already
Caroline. I keep your home, raise your three sons and our other children, and sleep <laughs> cooking, shopping, cleaning, and financial matters. The only thing that I know is my place in the world as a humble wife. That said, I did come across a scroll in your library stating that philosophy in Greece began way before you, two centuries ago. I was so surprised to discover what these early philosophers um, wrote about the nature of women. To many of them, um, the ultimate reality was a cosmic strife between opposites of equal strength, generating the sense of a world of hot and cold, wet and dry, male and female. Oh, everything was binary. Other than that, I don't even know what I don't know. What I don't know, I don't think I know. <laughs> no, well, that's good. Huh? It is good. Must everything be good or evil? Are all things so starkly juxtaposed? Must man be opposed to whom? Interesting question to ponder, my dear. <laughs> and ponder them you will. Please, Socrates. If my tool is to have any meaning, it is so that you are at liberty to examine these questions together with the other men at the symposium. <laughs> if you do not examine them, my life is not worth living, darling. Oh, wait, that's good too. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, I dreamed that the baby grew feathers and turned into a swan. Oh. oh. Socrates, I sorry to interrupt, but please let me introduce you to my good friend, Plato. Ooh, charm, I'm sure. Socrates, your reputation precedes you, and I've come to be enlightened by your reason. Plato, you are my swan of my dream. <laughs> well, to get you started, ponder my notion that. Uh, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, and uh, that, that I, I know that, uh, I know that I know nothing. <laughs> 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 yeah, I wish to deal with human beings, you know, to, to associate with man in general. That's my choice of wife. I know full well that if I can tolerate your spirit, I can, with ease, attach myself to every human being else. Oh, my master! <laughs> A, B, C of philosophy. Plato founded his own academy in 387 BC, permitting women to study with men. What? Some women rose high in the academy ranks and even dressed like the men. Plato and the other directors of the academy were mocked for opening their doors to women, but they insisted that women could be anything men could be, including philosophers. <coughs> Though with one caveat, women would never be as good as men. There is no special faculty of administration in the state which a woman has because she is a woman, or which a man has by virtue of his sex. But the gifts of nature are alike diffused in both. All the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also. Uh, but in all of them, a woman is inferior to a man. Hmm. In 367 BC, a 17-year-old orphan boy with slender calves, small eyes, and a love of clothes and rings enrolled in Plato's academy. His name was Aristotle. He eventually left the academy and married a high-born embryologist whose name was Pythias. A name derived from the small, the smell of rotted flesh from a python that Apollo slayed. Oh. So, Aristotle and Pythias traveled to Lesbos, an island rich in marine and plant life. Here, Aristotle combed the beach collecting specimens for his tax 
taxonomy. He believed that every living thing had a purpose, a way of being that best fulfilled its nature. And the only way to study its purpose was to begin with its biology. Mm. Pythias is thought to have worked alongside Aristotle. Uh, she picked the beautiful creatures, belly part of child, warm Mediterranean sun on her back, sand on her calves, a bag of octopus, and crab on her shoulder. Aristotle concluded and wrote from these surveys that the female oh. is, as it were, a mutilated male, a degenerate. Wow. wow. Um, Aristotle saw women as irrational and passive, needing the guidance of men, the bloody claws of menses were further evidence of their passivity. The active sperm were needed to form a full human being. One sex needs the other in an isometrical dynamic that exists not for convenience or harmony's sake, but because it's natural. That's correct. No. Uh, <laughs> Aristotle yes. also held that some men were so weak in reason that they were fit to be slaves, and he had a number of slaves on his own estate. Mm. Sure did. What? And anyone who disagreed with his ideas, he argued, must not be thinking. And so were more like untrained boxers or children with lisps. He said, lazy people who needed to work harder. Don't forget the most important part. Oh. Right. Um, what does it take to be a philosopher? A profound mind. Time and space. Quiet and trees. Sparkling things and bracelets. Yeah. Aesthetic harmony. Feng Shui. Wait, 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 wait. Who is going to do all the work? The, 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 the cooking, the growing, the harvesting, <laughs> the water gathering, the bringing, the building, the animal husbandry, the wine making. Uh, yeah. Women. Uh, slaves. Robot. <laughs> it takes time and space to think. It takes time and space for intellectual masturbation. <laughs> Aristotle's ideas on women's inferiority influenced Western thought for the next 22 centuries? Take out your... here at Oxford University. You must answer this question carefully and without bias. You have 12 hours for the test. If anyone needs an extra sheet of velum, I'll leave a carving knife on my desk. The sheep are out back. Ready? Yes, yes sir. sir. Question one, whether nature intends woman. That doesn't make sense. Question two. Whether woman's nature is as intelligent as man's. Question three. Ought Aristotle to have included a wife among the goods of the philosopher? Do not come up to me tearing the test, telling me that so-and-so's mom or girlfriend. I fuck your mom! Me too. Oh, oh. oh. oh chance. <laughs> We are testing your capacity for reason, not your levels of sympathy. sympathy. Now I repeat your bias aloud. Get started. Those were the real questions from 1598. Ah. Oh. Descartes says, Cogito ergo they, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, the mind and body are totally distinct. <laughs> that means, even if we assume that women's bodies are weak, it doesn't follow that their minds are too. In fact, they could be just as far as men, uh, which means they should attend universities, legislate laws. Not to put words in your mouth. What do you say about women? Hobbes said men and women in state of nature are equal. What, what about women in civil society? Mm, oops. What? Forgot.
forgot about them. Philosophy is concerned only with what's essential, which reminds me, it's time for my daily massage. Eleanor, meet me in my chambers. Dinarza argues the aim of civil society is to ensure our freedom. More specifically, the freedom to do philosophy. But women can't do philosophy, and so they can't be citizens. Duh. In my chapter on democracy, I say one may assert with perfect propriety that women have not by nature an equal right with men. And thus it cannot be that both sexes should rule alike, much less that men should be ruled by women. Oh, and why? I continue, and men and women cannot rule alike without great hurt to peace. But why? And I conclude, but of this, enough. <laughs> ha! So, so those are the final words of your political critique? Uh-huh. <laughs> Another one of my heroes first turned to fame. <laughs> Emmanuel Kant. <laughs> the most influential thinker of the Enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> Kant, who says, our minds can't but help see the world the way they do, and we can't be sure whether the way we see things is actually how they are. So, what is the way we can't help but see women, or great minds? Women's philosophy is not to reason, but to sense. Oh. Even if a woman excels in arduous learning and painstaking thinking, they will exterminate the merits of their sex. Oh. Oh. Man should be, become more perfect as a man, and the woman as a wife. Oh. 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 Thanks, Quinty. No, I'm just walking from a long slumber. <laughs> I can't know anything for certain. Oh, oh look you. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the epistemic uncertainty gives me an irrefutable idea. It's entirely rational for a man to pull around, but not a woman. Mm. Oh, you can't be certain who the father of the baby is. Mm. And as we all know, if a man isn't certain he's the father, then he won't care for the baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to care for the baby. Oh. Oh. oh! And this is the best of all possible worlds, and women have it good. Women! <laughs> I have often thought that women of elevated mind advance knowledge more properly than do men. Men, taken up by their affairs, often care no more than necessary about knowledge. Women whose condition puts them above troublesome and laborious cares are more detached and therefore more capable of contemplating the good and beautiful. <laughs> Gradually, it has become clear to me what every great philosophy oh. so far has been. A kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir. <laughs> also, that the moral or immoral intentions in every philosophy oh. constituted the germ of life from which the whole plant had grown. Oh, no. Nietzsche, that is actually so good. Women in general don't love any art. What's that? Are not knowledgeable in any and have no genius. Please stop. And that they are bad cooks who have delayed human development. Oh, oh. I'm so angry. Do you know if Gretchen is done roasting the Schneedel verse? <laughs> the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Well said, Wittgenstein. <laughs> this is why any time a woman walks into the conference room while I am speaking, I am silent. Hi guys, I'm Heinrich Pernell's Agrippa here from the late 15th century. You, you probably haven't heard of me, but I, I'm super keen on joining the club. Uh, maybe I could get an academic post, uh, work towards tenure, that sort of thing. So, so I, I, I've got this uh, theory that you might be interested in. Um, I believe there is a reason 
to, uh, to, to, to think that we are not equal to, if not superior to. Oh, what is that yeah. awful noise? <laughs> think straight. You're interrupting my rational activity. Oh, no way. <laughs> now, where, where, where were we, Hegel? A woman is like a plant. Their activity is more peaceful unfolding, whose principle is the more indeterminate unity of feeling. But man is like an animal. He's active. His reason pokes. Oh, let me add! Man is descended from a hairy-tailed quadruped, probably arboreal in its habits. Oh, but don't let that make you feel small, boys. All you need is a woman around to pop you up because man is superior to woman. And whatever he takes up, whether that's deep thought, or reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands. Oh, in my recent book, The Meaning of Disgust, by Colin McGinn, I argue that the feeling of disgust stems from a fear of death. Some objects like diamonds impart an idea of eternity. Is this why women tend to love jewelry so? Because of a relatively high level of bodily self-disgust. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm just asking. Oh, you are all complicit and insane. Oh, 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 oh. Slow down. Huh. You want to argue something, but do you have a dick? dick? What? <laughs> yeah, do you have a dick? Yeah, we won't listen unless you have a dick. Mm -hmm. I have. trifles with them, plays with them, humors and flatters them, as he does with a sprightly forward child. But he neither consults them about nor trusts them with serious matters. Uh, a man's education should make him an independent thinker, a citizen of democracy, not so for women. Monsieur Rousseau. The women's entire education should be planned in relation to men, to please men, to be useful to them, to win their love and respect, to help raise them as children, care for them as adults. Uh, uh, there are no conclusive arguments about feminine abilities and attitudes, but the discoveries of the scientists, so far as they go, lend some support to traditional reviews. Thank you so much. So now we're just going to do a quick shift and we're bringing on Nick, our moderator, um, who I'm going to let you just take it all from here. Sure. Um, in about two minutes, we're going to have a very brief post-show conversation with the lead artist of uh, these wonderful pieces that you just saw. So stick around if you can. And if you can't, now's the time. So we only have like 10 minutes, so we're going to get rolling and we're going to be very excited for our other artists to join us. Um, I, my name is Nick Benassaraf. I'm very honored to be sharing the stage with these artists. Um, I am a set designer and director and co artistic director of the Assembly and someone who studies his, for his doctorate on the third floor of this building. Um, uh, I'd love for you all, and my pronouns are he, him, I'd love for you all to go down and say your names, pronouns, and what you did. 
I'm Jessica Almacy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I directed and uh, yeah, I directed and hung out in Kate Benson's play. Hi, I'm Kate Benson. I wrote Where Are We Going, which was the first piece in this, and then I also read all of the words into the actor's ears because I am a tormentor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Deepali Gupta, she, her, hers, and I'm the creator of I Love You, Stranger. Hi, I'm Sofia Mieva, and the founder of Not Amused Theater, and uh, she, her, her, and um, yeah, we presented the philosopher piece. Thank you all very much. Um, so I'd love to start by asking each of you where you are in the process, um, and then we can get into the details. So this, this is a play that we have done one developmental workshop in reading. We have some former castmates in the, in the house, which is excellent. Um, so we've heard the whole thing and worked on the whole thing for a week, and then we just worked on this little piece for the couple of weeks to get ready for this. And that's it, it's brand new. Um, mine has been in gestation for a few years in one form or another, and then for the past um, few months we've been developing it with Ars Nova and their Makers Lab. And before that, sort of the first generation, the first draft was generated in the Civilians R&D group. So taking it from like sort of writer's group to writer's group, this was the first time that I brought um, other people into the, like, the making room with me. Um, Catherine Brookman and Star Busby are the other performers that I worked with, and having them in the room developing the material was critical, and then Ari Rodriguez is the director I worked with, and Michael Costaglioga. Costagliola was on sound for us. I just wanted to say their names. Yeah. Um, so this is very fresh for us. <laughs> this is pretty the first draft uh, of it. Um, uh, Regan Penaluna, who is in the audience over there, he's uh, the writer, so that's from her book that's coming out next year. Uh, and uh, Susu, that's uh, Susu Bagas next to her, has been a micro writer for a Medusa project about woman mythology that we've been uh, doing for a couple uh, years now. And so um, we just um, had uh, this uh, surprise and like love for this piece of uh, Regan and so we wanted to uh, work on it and bring it to stage so this is our first uh, draft and collaboration together. Yeah I, I'm excited to ask each of you um, if you had unlimited resources and this could become anything in the world um, is there something that uh, comes to mind either in terms of the process or what it would be like in performance how would you go about, let's say if you lived in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, um, but I hope you're going to answer. Yes, jump in, please. Okay, so this play started as a, as a secret hidden text of what it's like to live in a representative democracy. And the entire text has no gender pronouns. And so theoretically, anybody could play any part. And when we got together in the room in Vermont at Northern Stage, we discovered, or I discovered, that what I was really proposing was anyone can sound like Kate Benson. Um, but I think that that is not, still not a terrible exercise, so I hope people might disagree, but that's their right, um, because representative democracy. So what I would love is for six weeks, eight hours a day, rigor so that the actors could be supported in their efforts to really learn all eight parts so that they would have eight lives in their minds, eight, eight Kate Bensons, that's a fun kaleidoscope, uh, in their minds and, and be able to perform any of the parts at any time. Um, I don't know if that's possible, which is part of why it would be very exciting. I think it would require a lot of support. I also don't know Perhaps this was legible. All of the, most of the play, no, half of the play takes place in a passenger van, and the other half takes place in a Ramada Inn hotel room. Um, and so I would love that to, to at least be able to contemplate whether we need the realism of that set, um, whether there should be a carcass of a passenger van that suddenly magically turns into a hotel room. My literary agent was talking to me about it and she was like, yes, I mean, 
the grill on the front of the car could become the radiator in the room, which I'm not sure the last time I've been in a hotel room with a radiator, but I really love that idea. <laughs> so I, it's, it, it, if unlimited funds, I would want to be able to build the van and build the room and then throw it away if it didn't work. Uh, that's, that's a dream. My dream is also to have a huge spreadsheet of like every person and slash actor that we love and have them cite be paid well to cycle in and like get to be a part of the play. So it's never concretely cast. Everyone gets to be in it. Yeah, so if we continue with in-ear, then theoretically anyone could step in. And one of the beautiful things that happened about getting ready for this is that it was very difficult to get all eight actors in the room at the same yeah, time. Yeah, like 16 hours of rehearsal, and it was just really random. Yeah, so we had a lot of special guests come in and, and step in for one day of rehearsal, for which we have infinite... those infinite gratitude for our friends and colleagues who were willing to do that. But it did enlighten us that if we keep going with the in-ear technology in which some, you know, they're responding to what they hear, that you could host a lot of people. Have a hundred people on a list and they could just sign up for the performances they wished to attend, which would be a really exciting, radical experiment with this play. Probably. I would love um, a lot of design elements, fabulous costumes, um, but also I think, and this is something that I um, have seen, I think just um, in the audience after Slave played in the lobby, there were audience engagement um, people who were there to speak to the audience about their questions, their concerns, what they were feeling. And I think given the content of my piece, like that's a service that I really want to provide to my audience um, and I wish I could provide to all of you if you have anything to talk through I'm not your person but <laughs> um, no but and I think just like having the financial compensation for making the theater be equivalent to the emotional labor involved as well as the time and the and the mental energy yeah, yeah. Um, I will take everybody in the bus too and uh, put them in a farm where we can be fed. Or, I don't know. And we work and we don't worry about <laughs> New yes. York and New York's schedule. It's been also very challenging for us to, uh, to work uh, to get to today. Um, though fortunately, um, the ensemble today, the cast of today, was in Philadelphia uh, two weeks ago, so I got them there. <laughs> They were in Philadelphia, and then we like we worked for like we had a couple of rehearsal, and then once we rode back in New York, it was uh, really complicated um, to get together in a room to rehearse. So um, yeah, residencies um, outside of the city that can be supported and support the life also of everybody uh, for a few weeks, month. <laughs> well, <laughs> that will be. Uh, Beautiful because uh, for me, um, which I, I come um, one, two, three, I come from a physical theater with a mask work uh, to produce that result and that uh, expectation on stage. It's a lot of work, a lot of physical work, and it's uh, very demanding work. So it's uh, really hard to obtain this with the numbers of uh, though we try. And my cast, I find it fantastic for being game and playful and and hardworking and talented and um, and but we always want more and we want to research more how to subvert the text especially with a text like that how to uh, take the time to uh, play with it uh, about uh, this piece um, so as, as I said it was a new piece and uh, with uh, Susu over there and uh, Regan um, maybe this will come its own uh, play not sure yet, but uh, since we started to work, it was hard to be like, okay, we stop and this is the version we're gonna show <laughs> because it's an amazing material and I'm also learning a lot <laughs> through that history. And uh, so there's uh, a huge, uh, huge things to uncover, to digest and then to play with. And this is also time, that's it. Great, um, so I'm gonna, we have to, wrap up soon. I'm going to ask you one more question because we've got to turn this space over to the next uh, performance. And this is a brutal question to ask you to be succinct about, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Um, 
you know, for all of your works, uh, you're asking really big questions that register on a social level, you know, a societal level. How does the theater, um, what does the theater offer you as a forum for that kind of questioning? Um, and actually, with Nepali's case, I'm curious about what song offers you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start. I think um, song offers me a psychic landscape that I don't access in text. I think it offers the audience a landscape that and a type of attention that can be paid that is only musical attention. Um, and I think similarly, uh, in making this piece about um, disorder and mental illness, I think it's important that I put my body on stage and my body on the line and that there is a danger to that. But that to me is different than reading a book of poetry by a woman who is writing about her medication, which is valid and I love those books of poetry and I enjoy being like part of a lineage of writing about disease, but for me the only way I can talk about this is with my body. I am mostly interested in subverting what we think we know and cracking the egg of consciousness so that we can approach each other with more wonder and less certainty. Very succinct. <laughs> Sophie. And, uh, um, <laughs> uh, with the grotesque form, I intend to make people laugh. <laughs> Um, try to uh, keep digging deeper into what is mechanism of power and, and, and play with that, denounce them, subvert them, uh, to maybe be able to bring everybody to laugh together, just some kind of let go, yes. let's not take each other too seriously, and, and uh, yeah, big words. <laughs> but, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so please give these artists a round of applause. I, um, uh, thank you all for being here. I know that uh, you can be silly and playful in the lobby, and that will be very appreciated and talk, catch up with all these artists. Or at the there's party at 10 p.m. Um, there's another at 7 o'clock, but if we can just have everyone clear out before that, that would be wonderful. And there's a closing night party at the Museum of Sex at 10 p.m., y'all. <laughs>